Joining us today, the former CIA director, former secretary of state in the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo, out with a new book, and it is right here. It's called Never Give an Inch. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for the time. Brad, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on today. You know, I've read a large part of the book, and it's a fascinating read. What's what's your biggest takeaway from this process? I've written a few books on history, but not on my personal experience as much. Um, your your takeaway? Oh, a couple things. So I tried to write the history as accurately as I could reflect it. I tried to prioritize those things that really mattered. You know, a bunch of things that ended up on the cutting room floor. Just didn't think it wasn't that I was trying to hide them. It was just I didn't think they. Uh, they, they told the story of trying inside an establishment foreign policy world, uh, working to break glass in a way that kept the American people safe. And I want to tell some good stories, too. It's personal always when you tell them. It's from my point of view, what I saw. I was also about the only one that could tell the span of the whole four years, a lot of, a lot of turnover in the NASA security team, and wanted to make sure that we covered the challenges we faced day one and the way we went out the door on January 20th, 2021, and bookend how we always put the American people first. And it was a lot of fun to write. I think it's fun to read, too. Uh, it was a little bit better before the CIA cleared it, uh, but it's still <laughs> got some, it's still got some great spy stories as well. Well, speaking of which, you know, whenever a former official writes a book, there is always that possibility of classified information. <laughs> uh, and we are seeing that real time. I mean, we don't know why. Uh, then Vice President Biden did what he did. Now we have Vice President Pence, who has classified documents that were found at his his home. What's your thought on all of this? And are you sure you don't have any classified documents at home? Well, I'm pretty darn sure, Brett. Uh, but I guess <laughs> Vice President Pence was probably sure, too. Uh, let's let's be clear. Every one of us who handles lots and lots of classified information has a responsibility to handle it exactly the way we'd agreed we would. When you find it in a place it shouldn't be to turn it in and then figure out what went wrong to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Uh, whether you're President Trump or President Biden or Vice President Pence or an E5, I wrote about this, never give an inch. Uh, oftentimes classified information in the hands of young soldiers or young sailors or GS-12, uh, they get punished more than senior leaders who mishandle classified information. We should treat everybody equally. It shouldn't be politics. You shouldn't raid the home of one person and not another. Uh, and then every leader has a responsibility to try and get it right. And if you make a mistake, own the mistake. So now we're looking at Vice President Pence. He came forward, uh, said it was one box and said that it was a hurried transition um, and that he contacted uh, the FBI right away. Um, how do you see that in the panoply of what we've learned from Vice President, now President Biden and the former President Trump? I still think we don't know enough about any of these three situations to figure out what the different fact patterns are. Uh, one of the things I regret, uh, President Trump, President Biden, but they had, neither have been as transparent as they could be, right? Here's what happened. Here's how it got here. Here's what I knew. Here's what I didn't know. Full story, not from the spokesperson, not from some, but from them. Here, here's what I did. Here's my role in it. And by the way, uh, don't hand it off to somebody who was on your team. You, you own that. Uh, every leader owns these things. And so you shouldn't say you don't have any regrets. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what, if somebody found some documents that I had put in the wrong place at some point in time, uh, I would regret it uh, because I would have perhaps risked something that was really important. And so uh, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. Uh, but, boy, when you see something that you got wrong, own it, fix it, take responsibility for it, and then put processes in place so it doesn't happen again. It's it's that straightforward. You mentioned the CIA process. For people who don't know, um, what, what is that process like? Brett, I submitted the transcript, the manuscript for review to the Central Intelligence Agency, to the State Department, and to the Biden White House, to the White House and National Security Council. Uh, each of them conducted a review. They provided comments, uh, things they didn't want me to say. A lot of times it wasn't classified, just, hey, we'd prefer you not talk about this for a host of reasons. Uh, we had a little bit of back and forth, but we landed in a place, and ultimately they all signed off on the manuscript. What do you think your biggest success was in office and maybe biggest regret? Oh, goodness. Uh, from a process perspective, uh, I'm incredibly proud of how I took the CAA from where Director Brennan had it, uh, where they refused to talk about spying, uh, that they were focused on things not adjacent to the mission, right? Things like diversity, equity, inclusion, and 
lines on a chart and took it back to the days of the OSS where we were out doing great work. Tell these young kids, these young men and women, put a dagger in your mouth, get out there, do something for America. We took a lot of risk and delivered really good outcomes, really good outcomes with our partners like Mossad and Israel. And there's some great stories about the work we did against Iran, uh, really good work uh, countering threats all across the world. Uh, and I'm proud of that. We, we literally took the culture at the CIA and flipped the switch. And President Trump was fully supportive of that. Uh, in foreign policy, two things. Uh, we made clear to the world that the Chinese Communist Party is the biggest threat to our understanding of the way we live in the world today and began to fix it. And second, they, they told us it was impossible to create peace in the Middle East until you solve the problem of the Palestinian conflict. And we said that's a, uh, that's a crock. We, we created peace agreements between four nations and Israel. We pushed back against Iran. I you know, have a security detail today because of that. But we got the Middle East right. And the great news, Brett, is it's not just about the Middle East. If you live in Arizona or you live in Missouri or you live in Idaho, you're safe for today. And the chance that one of your kids or your family members or a friend who's in the Army or the Marines will have to go fight and die in that place in the Middle East is lower today. And I'm incredibly proud of each of those two accomplishments. China is a real threat, and we made peace in the Middle East. You, uh, biggest regret? Do you have one? Oh, yes. Um, we ultimately weren't successful at getting the nuclear weapons out of the hands of Chairman Kim. Uh, and never give an inch. I talk about the first trip I took there on Good Friday, coming back on Easter 2018. Uh, remarkable trip. Uh, setting the course for our negotiations with Chairman Kim. And while we got the remains of 50 Americans home, I got to bring three hostages home, one of whose story is told first person in the book. You get to hear his own words. It's really amazing about the greatness of America. Uh, but we, and we got him to stop testing long-range missiles, no nuclear tests, but he still has his nuclear weapons. And I, I regret we weren't able to make more progress there. You made mention of the security detail. The reason you have that is because Iran uh, has made specific threats based on the killing of uh, Soleimani, um, their top general over there. Uh, and it's not just you, there are others. Uh, but how has that changed? Obviously, you had security detail before, but it's not like this. How has that changed your day to day? Oh, goodness, Brett. Normally, when you leave service, no former cabinet members ever had security before. Uh, I think uh, I think George Tenet had a little bit uh, after he left at CIA, but I, I'll probably have this so long as the regime in Iran continues to exist. Look, it, it impacts you, but I have a great team that's keeping me safe. Uh, and so it doesn't it doesn't impact the way I interact with the world. I'm out there. Now, they also, importantly, Brett, keep uh, the people who are around me safe, too. When I go to big gatherings, when I'm in speaking to groups or out meeting with people, it keeps everyone that's around me safe as well. Uh, it does make it a little harder to go to 7-Eleven at midnight and get cough syrup. Uh, yeah, I think there's days Susan thinks I use it as an excuse, uh, <laughs> but, the, but the truth is, um, we have we have both determined, and we and I say we both Susan and I have both determined we we've done the right thing. We've served uh, the strike on Qasem Soleimani was righteous. I am confident it saved American lives, and whatever small impact it might have on my life, it was worth it. You know, you may make a decision to go into a race that um, gets you to another Secret Service detail. Um, when do you think you're going to make that decision to run for president or not? Yeah, Brett, it's a it's a, a reasonable question. I figure sometime in the late spring or early summer, Susan and I are praying about it. We're, we're, we're doing the things one might do to try and get yourself ready for that. Uh, but we haven't ultimately made the decision. It's It's quite an audacious thing to think that you ought to be president of the greatest nation in the history of civilization. And you want to make sure that you not only have it right in terms of the things you believe uh, and the policies that you're going to put forward, the arguments you're going to make to the American people, but also, Brad, importantly, uh, that you're not wolf tweeting, right? You are literally prepared to deliver that, to execute it. And one of the things I saw in four years in the Trump administration is we were slow and late getting our team on the field. And while we broke some glass, there was a lot more work to do. That next conservative president has got to be prepared to go in there on day one and get his team on the field and begin to actually put these policies in place so they can't be undone by the next president as, as a good deal of the work that we did in our administration has been undone. 
Former U.N. ambassador, uh, former South Carolina governor, Nikki Haley, uh, suggested to me that she believes she could be that person. She went as far as uh, she's ever gone, uh, very close to saying that she is, in fact, running for president. Uh, And I brought up some of the things you wrote about in this book about um, Ambassador Haley and, you know, that. Maybe she was trying to angle for Vice President Pence's job um, that she left really soon uh, from that U.N. ambassador job. You stand by everything in the book when it comes to Nikki Haley, right? I do. Everything I said is true and accurate. And what do you think about her prospects uh, as she seems to be heading towards running for president? Uh, Anyone who believes that they're the right person for the moment ought to go make the case. And in the end, the good people of Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina will sort it out at the front end, and then 50 states will sort it out at the back end. Uh, she'll have to make that decision for herself. But you know, Brett, the, the truth is, my the, the part of my book, the part I never give an inch, uh, where I mentioned Ambassador Haley, uh, really wasn't about that little story. We suffered from the fact that we had a lot of people who didn't want to serve in the Trump administration. It was hard work. Uh, you should know, lots of my friends were saying, Mike, run. Everything that Trump touches turns to, to ash. You have your reputation. Don't don't hang out there. Uh, and there were a lot of folks who took that and left and either didn't join the administration or when the going t- t- got tough, they just walked away from it. And that hurt us. That was, wasn't about the who. It wasn't about the name. It was about our mission to serve the United States of America. And, you know, as for me, uh, I'd hear that and I'd say, thanks. I appreciate your appreciate your wisdom. But I'm the Secretary of State, or I'm the CIA Director, whatever. I'm the Secretary of State for the United States of America, for goodness sake. I'm not going to give up a single second of my opportunity, the privilege I've been given, to try and make life better for the American people. You were going to to have to throw me out. And I suppose I could have been fired, but I wasn't going to quit. And so every day I got up, put my helmet on, tried to separate the noise from the signal, and tried to deliver for America. And those folks who just decided they didn't want to be part of that, they didn't want to serve because of who the president was or decided they wanted to leave while we still had lots and lots of work to do. It's just not about team. That's that's about something different. I'm not going to go too, too far down this road, but um, if you decide to run, you could hear former President Trump uh, saying, you know what? Mike worked for me. OK, he was huge. He was good, but he wasn't me. All right. Doesn't fill a stadium. I don't get to do that on the show that much, but um, I figured I'd give you that. The uh, you could hear that. That was world class, bro. How do you, how do you counter that? Uh, you counter with the truth, uh, and you counter with making arguments. It's not about Mike Pompeo. It is not about Donald Trump. It's about America. Uh, I, I was, you know, the Washington Post ran a story that said I was President Trump's most loyal cabinet member, and he, he called me and said. Mike, the Washington Post says, says you're my, I won't do the imitation. I'll leave that to you. He said, you, you, he says you're my, most loyal, you're my most loyal cabinet member. And I said, Mr. President, that was not intended as a compliment. <laughs> he said, you know, you're right, and hung up. Uh, I, I certainly served him, but I was serving the American people. And so if there's a campaign and President Trump makes that argument, uh, I'll, I'll smile. Um, I, I've heard him say it's disloyal. It, it, it is never disloyal when you believe that you offer something to the American people to proffer that and to make the case, and then they'll get this sorted out. One of the things you talk about in the book uh, that was controversial, which was uh, the Saudi relationship, and uh, obviously it soured, um, and it was a tough moment. Uh, it was a very interesting moment on a geopolitical sense when uh, Jamal Khashoggi was uh, was killed, and it pointed back uh, to the Saudis directly. Um, You say in the book that Khashoggi was not just some journalist, that he was an activist and had ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, That set off uh, Fred Ryan, the publisher of The Washington Post, and he he put out a statement uh, today saying it is shocking, disappointing to see Mike Pompeo's book so outrageously misrepresent the life and work of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi uh, as a CIA as the CIA, which Pompeo once directed, concluded Jamal was brutally murdered on the orders of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. His only offense was exposing corruption and oppression among those in power, uh, work that good journalists around the world do every day. It goes on to say that uh, it's a ploy to sell books. Uh, he's the publisher and CEO of the Washington Post. And I just want you to 
you know, respond to that uh, and, you know, what you think about what you said in the book and, and that reaction to it. Boy, lots to say. I, I'm unsurprised. The Washington Post went on a major mission uh, to uh, to undermine the work that we were trying to do to keep America safe in our relationship with Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They took out full page ads. Fair enough. They're free to do that. Maybe they're just selling newspapers, Brett. Uh, but I actually that's just kind of a joke. Uh, to suggest I wrote that to sell books is cynical and indecent uh, and immoral, and I regret that they did that. I didn't write that to sell books. I, I wrote that to explain how we were thinking about keeping the American people safe. We were very clear. The murder of Jamal Khashoggi was heinous, and we sanctioned 13 Saudis for what they did there. We also knew that the life of Mr. Khashoggi, nor of any individual, is more important than saving lots of American lives. That includes our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines all across the world and in the Middle East who are defending us. The security relationship between the America and the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is an incredibly important one. And so while we held the Saudis accountable, we knew that that relationship mattered an awful lot. And it's, it's fascinating now to look at this now a couple of years. And by the way, you're right. It was a difficult time. Uh, it was it was a hard decision to make because you'd had someone murdered and no, no one's going to say no one's going to say no that's okay. Uh, we didn't say that was okay, uh, but you know a couple years on it's fascinating to watch. President Biden says, well, because of that they're a pariah nation. Remember this? It's not that long ago, uh, and then has to go on bended knee to the kingdom begging for the Saudis to produce oil to get him out of a political fix that he was in. Uh, we were never naive about the reality of the world. It is indeed a nasty, brutal place. And our function every day, Brett, was to do our level best to deliver security and prosperity for the American people. And that meant an important relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We were going to coach them, cajole them, urge them to be better actors on human rights. But we got this relationship right. And in the end, it not only delivered a better relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but you would not have the Abraham Accords, the peace agreements between Arab states and Israel, saving how many American lives for kids who won't have to go fight and die in that place because we brought peace to the Middle East. You can't have it both ways. You can't tell the Arab nations, boy, you're not behaving right, and then demand that they make peace with the nation of Israel. We have the right end of this. We had the right end of the stick on this one. I'm very proud of the work that we did. Yeah, but but your other point was that essentially. He was not just a pure columnist for the Washington Post. Yeah, it, it, it was more complicated than that. It, it was far more complicated. This is a man who praised Osama bin Laden when he passed away. Right? It's just, it's, we could spend a lot of time going into the details. Most of them are public. Uh, but suffice it to say, uh, this, this wasn't somebody working for the uh, Wichita Eagle co covering soccer games. This, this was, he, he was, he was a multifaceted person. But, that, that uh, none of that, none of that's intended to diminish the fact that he was murdered. Just simply to say that this is a complicated problem set in a complicated part of the world, and America's function in that is that we, we weren't responsible for killing him. Our responsibility is to make sure that we saved American lives, and I am confident that we did that. Mm -hmm. um, as you look at the world stage and, and you take yourself from the Middle East and you go to the, the Far East and, and China, you've talked before about the threat from China, not only long term, but short term. Um, do you think that Xi Jinping is watching closely what's happening in Ukraine as to what China does in Taiwan? Brett, in, in the book, you never give an inch. I actually talk about the, the inner interrelationship between these conflicts. Uh, there's no doubt that Xi Jinping is watching what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, probably causes him to question whether his generals and admirals are lying to him like Putin's were lying to him. So he's probably double-checking what he's really got under the hood. But he is also watching how the West behaves. Will they stay unified? When a sovereign nation is invaded, will they actually provide them with the tools to defend themselves, not just to get a quagmire or a stalemate, but to actually crush their adversaries? No, I, I think he's watching this very closely, and it provides yet another good reason for the American people to support giving the Ukrainians the tools that they need to defend themselves. So when you hear uh, people in your party say, you know what, it's too much. We've, we've got to secure the border. We've got to build schools. We've got to uh, fix infrastructure in the U.S. Why are we giving all this money um, 
to this cause. And there is a growing faction, especially in House Republicans, who say that out loud. What do you say? Yes, many of these are my friends, Brett. I was part of the conservative group in the House of Representatives for six years. I know a lot of these folks who are saying that. I think they just misunderstand the risk to the United States of America from Vladimir Putin's successful invasion of Europe. That is a bad outcome for people in Iowa and South Carolina and New Hampshire. It's really, really bad. It'll raise prices. It'll mess up our economy. It'll tell Xi Jinping he's got a green light. I, I could go on. Uh, I understand their sentiment when they say, boy, we should fix our border. Sign me up for that. Never give an inch talks about how I was at the center of doing that during the Trump administration. Uh, we should fix our schools. Now, sign me up for that, too. Uh, but these aren't mutually exclusive options. America has the capacity to do each of these things. And the real risk to the United States of failing to get this right is a Vladimir Putin on the march through Europe. And at some point, at some point, someone asking for us to send the 82nd Airborne or Marine Rifle Division. I do not want to reach that point. It's why we spent so much trying, time deterring Vladimir Putin from doing what he did to Joe Biden, attacking a European country on his watch. Uh, it didn't happen on ours. And we should make sure now that we provide the Ukrainians with what they need to push back against us and restore the very deterrence that America had just 24 months ago. I saw you in a um, Twitter battle of sorts um, with the head of the teachers union um, and in something you said and she responded and um, Randy Weingarten. And I was wondering, was that designed to say I get domestic policy, too? No, I, I spent most of my life raising a family and running a machine shop in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> that, that's my life. And then serving as a member of Congress where I dealt with energy and ag issues and education issues. That's Everyone knows me as the CIA director and the Secretary of State, but that's where I frankly spent most of my life was on things that matter here at home. And I just watched this debate about what was taking place in our schools where we'd closed them down for COVID. And I have long known that the Kansas Teachers Union was bad for students in Kansas. I worked on this before I lost my mind and ran for Congress. Mm -hmm. And so I was I was simply remarking on the fact that Randy Weingarten has destroyed the education for kids across America. And over the last couple of years, it's actually hurt the least amongst us the most. And that makes her really dangerous because if you if you don't regenerate a nation with an understanding of our founding, if you teach them crap, if you teach them that we're a racist country and there's an oppressor class and this country was founded in a way that was ill-gotten and we're the bad actor in the world and you apologize for America. If that's what our kids learn in school, Brett, I don't know what the 72nd, 73rd, 74th Secretary of State's going to do. He'll, he'll be, I was going to use an adult word, he'll be in real trouble uh, because it, America and our institutions depend on people who know and appreciate the greatness of our country. And Randy Weingarten has been at the center of undermining that for decades. This is a podcast. You can use whatever word you want. So, um, no, I, I uh, saw that back and forth, and I, I thought um, there was really something because it does touch a lot of families, um, specifically because they dealt with it, especially during COVID. Do you think you know every time we go into an election season, especially a presidential election, we think as as a former debate moderator. You know, education should be up there. And then when push comes to shove, we've got all these different topics. Do you think that this time education might be higher on the on the totem pole? You know, it's an interesting question, Brett. Your, your point on the history, I think, is probably exactly right. By the way, it, it wasn't the FCC with the bad word I was worried about. It was my mother. <laughs> <in heaven. laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I, I hope it is. I hope it is in two ways. One, in the end, it's not the federal government that really drives education policy, right? It, it's a bottoms-up deal. School boards, uh, PTAs, uh, boards of regents at state universities across America, those are the places where we've really built educational excellence for decades in America. But the federal government can mess it up. So I, I do hope that when we have uh, debates for the president, I hope they will talk about how uh, the Department of Education is mostly – creating problems and not solving them. I hope it'll talk about the things the federal government might do to make that better, to devolve that power back to uh, the people and to parents so that they can teach their kids in a way that is representative of their family and their family's value set. Um, the book is great. Never Give an Inch, uh, Fighting for the America I Love. Uh, former Secretary of State, former CIA Director Mike Pompeo, we appreciate the time. Brett, thank you, sir. Have a good day.